procurement regulations webinar on the procurement in action, procurement methods, and procedures and required contracts session for public body. I'm Jana Rumini, Barriers Incident Corporate Communications, and we are extremely pleased that you are able to participate in today's session. At this time, we recognize our Chairman and Procurement Regulator, Mr. Mila Laucha. While he will not officiate today, he is available to take any questions that you may have at the end of the session. The team who will be presenting today are Head of Procurement Policy Department, Development Department, Ms. Pastora Brown, Policy Officer, Ms. Danita Singh, and Legal Policy Research Officer, Ms. Haksa Sukhena. Before we begin the formal aspects of today's proceedings, please allow me to go through some helpful tips for a successful session. Note that your mics will be muted. Your questions during the session can be sent via the chat option on the team's platform. These questions will be collated by our team and addressed in our question and answer segment at the end of the session. Please keep your contributions helpful and be considerate to our presenters and other participants. At the end of today's session, you will be invited to provide your feedback. Feel free to help us improve future sessions to better match your needs by letting us know what worked well and what did not. Please note that this session is being recorded and will be shared via email and uploaded to our website. Without further delay, we now welcome Ms. Pastora Brown, who will share some open Ms. Brown. Thank you, Chandi. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to all participants to Module 4 of the Office of Procurement Regulations Procurement in Action webinar series. Please ensure that you have today's presentation handy. We will be covering two important topics today procurement methods and procedures, and supply contracts. And you will find a copy of the case study assignment on slide 68 of your presentation. So we are making great progress in terms of the training. Thus far, we have covered annual procurement planning, market research report and analysis, Developing, developing requirements and specifications. And of course, today we will be looking at procurement methods and procedures and supply contracts. And in November, we will be covering evaluation methodology and contract management plan. And we will also be working on developing the procurement strategy and completing the procurement strategy development form. You will recall that last day, we looked at the steps involved in operational level planning. And these steps are applicable to every round of procurement. We also discussed that as you continue this good practice, you will be building individual organizational and national capacity for the public procurement function. So just very quickly, once you have identified your procurement need, your next step will be to conduct your market research. Your market research data and the conclusions you have drawn therefrom will feed into the next step, which is the completion of your procurement strategy development form. On that form, you will analyze the, the conclusions and the data that you would have uh, received from the market research report. You will also identify all of your procurement risks, and you will go ahead with the development of your procurement strategy for that particular procurement activity. Your strategy will include the procurement method or the most appropriate procurement method. 
It will also include the evaluation methodology, criteria, sub-criteria, and scoring system. It will also contain the selection method for the procurement, and it will also contain the contract management plan. So when you look at the screen, you see that once you have taken the time to complete your planning properly, your procurement method, evaluation methodology, evaluation criteria, sub criteria, and scores, as well as your selection method, can just be transposed from your procurement strategy development form into your ITB or your RFP document. When you move towards evaluation and award of contract, the evaluation methodology criteria and scores that you would have developed, as well as your selection method, all based on your analysis, your risk analysis related to your procurement, you, you will find that that information is useful for your evaluation and award. And of last but not least, we have the contract management plan, with, which will assist you with the management of your contract. So you can see how neatly it all fits together. So once again, a quick recap, some of the benefits associated with completing all of this advanced work prior to actually developing and issuing your RFP or your ITB or even your RFQ. Some benefits include achieving the objective of promoting transparency and accountability in all of your procurement actions, identifying your procurement risks and determining how you will mitigate those risks upfront, obtaining approval for your procurement strategy, having clear justification for your procurement decisions, and best of all, completing the procurement process once you actually get it started quicker and easier. And what that means is that you will not be taken by surprise by any information presented in the bids, which will cause you to delay the evaluation process while you try to work out the best way to move forward towards the recommendation of a word of contract. So, ladies and gentlemen, remember that you will benefit most from these sessions by actively participating in the workshop sessions, and we encourage you to do this as you have been doing thus far. And without further ado, I would now like to hand you over to Ms. Devika Singh, Policy Officer, who will take you through today's first presentation. Thank you, Postnora, and good morning, everyone. So in today's session, we will look at the procurement methods and procedures, procurement techniques, supply contracts, and then we'll have as was Sarah indicated, our case study assignment followed by a review of your responses. Next, we'll then move on to a short multiple choice quiz, followed by a question and answer session. And lastly, we'll have a feedback survey for you to complete. So based on our agenda, we have a very packed session today. So let's get started. Procurement methods and procedures. Firstly, let us distinguish between what is defined as a procurement method and what is defined as a procurement procedure. Procurement methods, put simply, can be described as prescribed or approved processes or practices in which a procuring entity which is, purchases goods, routes, and services. Whereas Procurement procedures are a sequence of steps that a procuring entity follows for a given procurement method. So let us take a look at procurement methods and how exactly a procuring entity goes about 
choosing the most appropriate type of procurement method for a given procurement activity. Now, the decision regarding which procurement method to use is based on full consideration of the circumstances of the procurement itself. So, for example, the procurement method for an off the shelf low value item, for example, the procurement of a microwave for the office, would require a less structured procurement method like request for quotation. Whereas the procurement method for the construction of a school um, would use open tendering as this may be more appropriate. Now, additionally, another example, the procurement method for the purchase of one computer for company X would be different for company Y who's purchasing 300 computers. And this could be due to the market conditions, could be due to the capacity of the firm to supply on a smaller or larger scale, as well as the capacity of um, the procurement officer to select and to successfully operate a complex procurement method while ensuring that the abuse and corruption are not introduced into the process. So now there are two main types of procurement methods, right? So the first main type is open bidding. And this is a procurement method that is based on an invitation to bid that is advertised publicly, either nationally, regionally, or internationally. And a procuring entity may also engage in open bidding by means of two-stage bidding. The second type of procurement method is limited bidding. And this is where a procuring entity does not publicly advertise the procurement opportunity, but instead is to use invitations to bid directly to a selected number of bidders, either through market research or the procurement depository. Now, single source procurement, sole source procurement, request for quotations, and competitive negotiation are considered under the umbrella of limited bidding, as bids are directly issued to selected bidders. However, in a request for proposal type proceedings, procuring entity may engage in either open bidding or limited type bidding. So what we'll do in the next few slides, we will look at each of these in a little more detail. So let's start with open bidding. Now open bidding is the most appropriate procurement method when the procuring entity is seeking to maximize the potential pool of suppliers and contractors in order to achieve the highest levels of transparency, value for money, and public confidence. Now, an example of a procurement activity that open bidding would be most appropriate for would be the construction of a highway. Conversely, a procuring entity would not utilize open bidding in the procurement of, say, 10 IXL folders, as this would result in a waste of time and resources by the organization for this off the shelf item, as well as it will not represent the achievement of value for money. Now, the procedure for carrying out open bidding involves six simple steps. First, the procurement notice is drafted. Then the procuring entity publishes the advertisement, and this is, could be done, as you said, locally, regionally, or internationally. It, the procuring entity then issues um, procurement documents upon request to the suppliers or contractors. 
the bids are received and evaluated. Prohibition of negotiation with suppliers or contractors uh, is done, and a public body may opt to utilize the service of either a probity advisor or probity auditor for the procurement contracts that are considered high risk for challenge proceedings. That is what the prohibition of negotiation with suppliers or contractors entails, right? And lastly, prior to award of contract, the standstill period is implement, implemented if applicable to the specific procurement activity. Now, limited bidding, on the other hand, restricts the number of bidders invited to tender due to the highly complex or specialized nature of the good works or service, or the time and cost required to examine and evaluate a large number of bids would be disproportionate to the value of goods, works, or services being procured. Um, a limited bidding would be most appropriate, appropriate for, say, catering services, for example, for a staff function consisting of just 10 employees as a large number of bids would be disproportionate to the value of this procurement activity. Now, the major difference between the, the um, procedure for opening, open bidding compared to limited bidding is that the solicitation document is issued directly to the selected bidders. But in all other aspects, the procedures listed for open bidding would remain the same. Now we move on to request for quotations. And uh, this is appropriate for the procurement of readily available, relatively low priced goods or services. So, for example, um, in the purchase of an infrared ter ter thermometer, which I'm sure most of you in your organization would have procured, and an RFP, RRQ type procurement method would be most appropriate for this type of feature. The procedure for um, the request for quotation involves quotation being requested in writing from as many bidders as practical. The written request for quotations shall contain a clear statement of the procuring entity's requirement as to the quality, quantity, terms, and time to deliver. The next step is where bidders should be given adequate time, no fewer than five working days, to prepare and submit their quotation. And lastly, the successful quotation shall be the lowest priced quotation meeting the needs of the procuring entity as set out in the request for quotation document. Let us take a quick recap of the procurement methods and procedures we looked at thus far. We looked at open bidding and in open bidding, as we said, this is for large scale, high value projects for goods, works and services. Right, and the method of invitation, um, this is advertised publicly. Then we looked at restricted or limited bidding, and this is for low value, simple procurement or highly specialized or complex goods. Um, only available from a limited number of suppliers. And direct solicitation is normally conducted for this type of procurement method. And lastly, we looked at request for quotation. And this is for off the shelf routine items in established markets. And again, direct solicitation is used for this type of method. Now, let's take a look at single source procurement. 
And this is a non-competitive method of procurement whereby a procuring entity engages one supplier or contractor for a procurement, even though other suppliers or contractors are available in the market. Now, the decision to engage in single source procurement should be made in a procuring entity's procurement strategy. Now, there are many conditions for, of use for single source procurement that are outlined in the Procurement Methods and Procedures Regulation 2021, which is available on the OPR's website. Um, so we have just highlighted a few for you on the slide, which is it could be used where the subject of the procurement is to be delivered or carried out by a supplier or contractor who is in possession of relevant information and data, or where the subject of the procurement is a good, which is a spare or replacement part or equipment in use by a procuring entity. Now, an example of a single source procurement could be the purchase of a replacement part for laptops, which are under warranty by a procuring entity as it is more feasible and economical to purchase this replacement part from the initial supplier of the laptop. Now the procedure for single source procurement requires that approval is gained from the procurement officer who makes a recommendation which is thereafter approved by the accounting officer or equivalent in a public body. After sufficiently detailing the justification for the need to engage in single source selection. Step two of the single source procedure is where the procuring entity then requests a proposal or contract price quotation from the supplier or contractor. And lastly, the procuring entity engages in negotiations with the supplier or contractor. So now we move on to sole source procurement. And sole source procurement is a method of procurement to be utilized where there's only one supplier or contractor that is capable of providing the subject of a procurement. So the decision to engage in sole source procurement should be made and approved again in your organization's procurement strategy. And just like single source, Procurement. There are many conditions of use for sole source procurement, which are outlined in the Procurement Methods and Procedures Regulation 2021. And again, this is available on the OPR's website. So we'll ju we just highlighted a few. And sole source procurement, the conditions of use would be for reasons of extreme urgency as well as for the provision of additional goods or services by the supplier who provided the initial good or service. It could be used for the provision of additional goods or services, provision of goods or services, which consists of the repetition of similar services, which conform to a basic project. An example of sole source procurement is the provision of additional features to say a database by a supplier who initially provided the software designed specifically for company X. The procedure for sole source procurement involves four simple steps 
On step one is where the bidding documents, including the required quantities, technical specification, and standard terms of conditions provided. Next, the procuring entity shall review the submission it receives for conformity with the quantities, technical specification, and contract terms and conditions set out in the bidding document. The submission, which complies with the requirements set out in the bidding document, shall be reviewed by the procuring entity to determine whether the price is fair and reasonable. And lastly, where the submission offers a price which exceeds the allocated budget of the procurement, the procuring entity may negotiate price reduction. Moving on to competitive negotiations. Now, this is where a procuring entity engages in negotiation with a sufficient number of qualified suppliers or contractors to ensure effective competition. There is an urgent need for the goods, works or services and engaging in any other competitive met method of procurement because of the time involved in using those methods would therefore be impractical provided that the circumstances given rise to the urgency were neither foreseeable nor the result of delaying tactics or on its part. So a recent example of where this method would be applicable is with the in is applicable is would be with the engagement of a contractor to fix the collapse of, of a large portion of demands in Alamiaro Main Road in 2020 in 2014 due to heavy rains and flood water. So the procedures involved for competitive negotiation would be step one, the procuring entity engages in negotiation with a sufficient number of suppliers or contractors to ensure effective competition. Step two, the procuring entity ensures that any information communicated to a supplier or contractor before or during the negotiation shall be communicated at the same time and on an equal basis to the other suppliers or contractors. Upon completion of negotiations, requests um, a request to all bidders to submit a best and final offer with respect to all aspects of the proposal. Now, no negotiations shall take, shall take place between the procuring entity and bidders with respect to their best and final offer. The contract is awarded to the bidder that best meets the needs of the procuring entity as determined in accordance with the evaluation criteria. So let us take a quick recap at the last three procurement methods and procedures we just reviewed. So we looked at competitive negotiation and this the application for this would be where the solution for requirements involves negotiations to adequately satisfy the procurement need. Single source procurement is another one we look, just looked at, and this is where there's only one, this is where only one supplier or contractor is invited to bid, even though there are other suppliers or contractors. And sole source procurement, this is where there's only one supplier or contractor capable of providing the goods, works, or services. 
OK, so let us look at requests for proposals. So a very clear and simple exam, um, definition of a request for proposal, and this is a formal invitation from a procuring entity to a supplier or contractor to propose a solution to resolve a stated problem. It is a process whereby the evaluators base their award decision not solely on price, but on a variety of factors such as qualifications of the firm and its key personnel, methodology, and approaches, and even prior experience. So let us take a look at request for proposal without negotiation. And this is a formal invitation from a procuring entity to a supplier or contractor to propose a specific solution to fulfilling a specific requirement. Now, an example of a request for proposal without negotiations may be in the purchase of an accounting and payroll software. As this procurement is relatively standard in nature, and all aspects of the proposals can be evaluated without resorting to discussion, dialogue, or negotiation. So the procedures involved for a request for could a request for proposal without negotiations involve Step one, inviting proposals, which can be done either publicly or it can be done directly to pre-qualified or pre-selected bidders. The second step of this of request for proposal without negotiation is managing the solicitation process. And this involves hosting pre-submission meetings and site visits, as well as responding to requests for clarification from bidders and issuing addenda. The third step of this method involves receiving and opening proposals. <coughs> And only the technical proposals are opened and commercial proposals are, remain unopened in a secure location. The fourth step of this type, this procurement method, is the evaluation of bids and award of contracts. And this has four parts. For this part, procuring entity evaluates and ranks the technical proposals in accordance with the pre-established criteria, which was specified in the RFP document. <coughs> next, next section of this um, step, non-responsive bids shall be rejected and a notice of rejection and a reason for rejection together with the unopened commercial envelope <clears throat> shall be dispatched to each respective bidder. Responsive bidders, on the other hand, shall be invited to the opening of their commercial proposals. And the procuring entity shall award the contract to the bidder with the highest combined score. <clears throat> so the request for <clears throat> now we look at the request for proposals with dialogue. And this is a process in which bidders assist in defining the statement of needs to obtain the most satisfactory solution to its procurement activity, resulting in a best and final offer. 
Now, an example of a procurement activity that would be appropriate for using this type of method would be the construction of, say, a new plan. So with request for proposals with dialogue, the procedure is very similar to the request for proposal without negotiation. In, re in regards to step one to three remains the same. Where step one, you invite proposals. Step two, the procuring entity manages solicitation documents. Step three, they receive an open proposal. The differences in step four, which is the evaluation of bids and the award of contracts. So let's go through this, sec this step. So, procuring entities evaluate and rank the technical proposals in accordance with the pre established criteria. Next, non responsive bids shall be rejected, and responsive bidders whose proposal meet the requirements shall be invited to participate in dialogue. The dialogue shall be conducted by the same representative of the procuring entity. Next, the procuring entity invites responsive firms to submit a best and final offer following the dialogue. Now, no negotiations shall take place after submission of the best and final offer. And the contract is awarded to the bidder that best meets the needs of the procuring entity as determined in accordance with the evaluation criteria. Now we move on to request for proposals with consecutive negotiations. And this is, an, this is a two envelope system known as rank and run, where consecutive negotiations with responsive bidders are required in order to ensure that the commercial terms and conditions of the procurement are acceptable. So an example of a procurement activity that would be appropriate for using this type of method would be the provision of design build services. Again, just like the previous um, method, that is RFP with negotiations, RFP without negotiations, this procurement method, the procedure remains the same as in the first three steps remain the same. And the only difference in the procedure takes place in step four, which is the evaluation of bids and the award of contract. So again, the procuring entity evaluates the technical proposal in accordance with the pre-established criteria specified in the RFP. Non-responsive bids shall be rejected. Responsive bids are ranked in accordance with the criteria for evaluating proposals and negotiation with the highest ranking bidder takes place. And if negotiation does not result in a procurement contract, the procuring entity may invite other responsive bidders for negotiation on the basis of their ranking until arriving at a procurement contract or until all commercial proposals are rejected. You should note that procuring entities should not reopen negotiations with any supplier or contractor with which negotiations were terminated. So let's do a quick recap again. 
looked at requests for proposals without negotiation. And this is standard procurement requiring, and this is where it, there's a standard procurement requiring no negotiation. Um, a specific solution for a specific requirement, which does not require discussion or negotiation. And this can be done through public notice or direct solicitation. Then we looked at requests for proposals with dialogue and dialogue and for this procurement method is needed to determine satisfactory procurement solution and contract is for research equipment study or development purposes and this can be done through public notice or direct solicitation Next, we looked at request for proposal with consecutive negotiation. And this would be applicable for solution for requirement, which involves this is the application for this is for solution for requirement involving negotiations to adequately satisfy the procurement need. And this can be done through public notice or direct solicitation. OK, so let's look at. Two stage bidding. Now, two stage bidding is a phase process. In which responsive bidders are engaged in refining their technical proposal to obtain the most satisfactory solution to the procuring entities activities. Now the conditions for using two stage bidding is where it may be impractical to prepare complete technical specifications in advance of the procurement, as well as where discussions with suppliers or contractors are required to refine the terms of reference or technical specifications to obtain the most satisfactory solution to its procurement needs. So two stage bidding is normally preceded by an expression of interest. And this method is mainly used in complex plants or large complex facilities design and building works. So an expression of interest is therefore part of the qualification process to receive a tender document. The procuring entity requests the supplier contractors to express an interest in providing goods and services for a project such as a construction job. Now, there are two procedures involved in two stage bidding. The first procedure involves stage one, inviting prospective bidders to submit a technical proposal on partially developed technical specifications. Next, the procuring entity evaluates and scores the technical proposals, inviting the highest ranked bidder to agree on a proposed technical solution. The second stage involves the procuring entity inviting the highest ranked technical proposal to submit a commercial offer based on an agreed technical solution. The second procedure, which may be used in two stage bidding. And this again is a, a has two two steps. So in stage one. The procuring entity invites prospective bidders to submit technical proposals. On partially developed technical specifications. 
the procuring entity evaluates and scores the technical proposals, inviting all prospective bidders to clarification and discussion meeting to finalize the technical requirements. The second stage of this procedure has four steps. First step the, is where the procuring entity invites responsive bidders to submit technical and commercial proposals based on the amended technical requirements. Secondly, the procuring entity evaluates the technical proposals first and keeps the commercial proposals sealed and secured. Now, firms achieving the minimum technical qualifying mark or greater are invited to the opening of their commercial proposals. Commercial proposals are evaluated and the firm achieving the highest combined score, that is technical and the commercial, is invited to contract negotiations. Now, if negotiations fail, the next highest ranked firm is called for contract negotiations. So at this point, we have come to the end of our review of procurement methods and procedures. Welcome back. And now I'll hand you over to Ms. Singh and she'll be going through procurement techniques with you. Okay, so thank you, John Bell, and welcome back, everyone. Hope that five minutes you as well you're well rested <laughs> okay so now we're going to take a look at procure two procurement techniques firstly we look at electronic reverse auctioning and this is an online real-time purchasing technique utilized by the procuring entity to select the successful submission, which involves presentation by suppliers or contractors of successful, successively lowered bids during a scheduled period of time and the automatic evaluation of bids. Now, an electronic reverse auction shall only be utilized for the procurement of goods in a competitive market of qualified suppliers to participate in electronic reverse auction to ensure effective competition. Now, electronic reverse auction shall utilize the open bidding method up to the final stage preceding the award of the procurement contract and then engage in electronic reverse auction to determine the lowest price. Now, this technique may be applicable in the procurement of, say, printing paper in large quantities. The second technique we'll look at is framework agreements and this is an agreement or other arrangement between one or more procuring entities and one or more contractor or supplier which establishes the terms in particular the terms as to price and where appropriate quantity under which the contractor or supplier will enter into one or more contracts with the procuring entity during the period in which the framework agreement or arrangement applies. So an example of a framework agreement may be for the 
purchase of stationary items, including pens, pencils, folders. Very simple. In a framework agreement, there are different types, and this would include a single vendor framework agreement, and this is where one vendor supplying the total requirements for a given type of good or service. Then we have multiple vendors without secondary competition. And this is where there are two or more vendors supplying the same requirements with clear differentiation or established criteria for using each vendor. And then we have multiple vendors with secondary competition. And this is where there are two or more vendors supplying the same requirements. And placement of orders is determined through a secondary competition. So for most agree agreements, um, you can get more information on this in the general guideline on supply contracts, which is accessible on the OPR's website. So at this point in time, I've come to the end of my presentation, and I will now hand you over to my colleague Hafsa to take you through the second section of second part of this session. Thank you, Davika. Good day, everyone. And my part of today's session is to introduce you to supply contract. For this part of the session, we will look at various types of supply contracts used in public procurement, as well as the key considerations for selecting the appropriate contract type so that it suits the circumstances of the particular procurement. First up is a definition of a contract, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with this definition of a contract, a legally binding agreement between two or more parties. Basically, contracts are used to create a relationship between two or more parties. It also defines the conditions of how the parties interact within a given set of circumstances. Now, the legal document that records the formal execution of the agreement is known as the contract instrument. This would generally contain the legally enforceable acts, rights, obligations, and duties that would direct both parties in the conduct of their business relationship. So this slide shows some of the documents that fall into the category of contract instrument, instruments as it pertains to procurement. I'm sure you're familiar with some, if not all of these. Now, just a note on framework agreements, Strictly speaking, they only become contract instruments when an order is placed. Here we have just a reminder of the elements that must be present for a contract to be enforceable. Offer, acceptance, consideration, capacity, consent, and legality. Now let's look at what is a supply contract. Basically, the seller promises to supply all of the specified items that the buyer needs for a specified time at an agreed price or rate. The buyer in turn agrees to purchase the agreed items from this seller. Now this may or may not be exclusive as in a case of framework agreements with multiple suppliers. You could recall that from what Devika just went through. Now, this is the arrangement which a contract instrument would govern. Before we delve into the various types of supply contracts, let's touch on the why, the when, and the who. Why do we need to select the type of supply contract? Well, in the planning phase, it's because it determines the buyer's relationship with the supplier, it addresses risk allocation, it positions the buyer in terms of contract and supply ma contract management and supplier management, and it could stimulate the interest of suppliers in doing business with you, as certain types of contracts are more attractive to some suppliers. 
When do you determine the type of contract that is suitable to your spe specific procurement activity? It starts as early as in your annual procurement planning, and I hope you recall from session one that the annual schedule of plan planned procurement activities, which is a fa public facing document, requires this information. When identifying your requirements, developing your specifications, also your market research and analysis will provide you with common types of contracts used in a particular industry. And as we last, as we went through in the last three sessions, these activities will reveal to you any and all risks associated with your procurement activity. And selecting the appropriate contract allows you an opportunity to protect your organization and get value for money. Now the who. Who selects the appropriate type of contract? Notice the use of the word select, not draft. On the slide, you will see a number of positions identified, and this is because of the different scenarios specific to the procurement activity and the organization. In the best circumstances, selecting the supply contract should get input from the end user, legal, experts in the field, and procurement. In other circumstances, or in larger organizations that have, for example, procurement and contract officers, it could be procurement's role. In fact, these persons may even be required to draft the contract. I expect most of you are thinking that it could be left up to the legal unit to pull something together. Consider, what if your organization has no legal units and only has procurement staff? Well, it's important to remember that you want the contract to align with the procurement activity. Legal's job is to draft, review, and advise based on risks and outcomes identified. In summary, the best approach is a cross-functional team with persons who have sufficient knowledge and experience to align the contract type to desired outcomes of the specific procurement activity. Seems like a lot, but not to worry. The OPR has developed several draft contracts to assist public bodies, and these can be found on the OPR's website. On this slide, you can see the three types of supply contracts that public bodies can use when undertaking procurement activities. As you know, draft contracts are included in the package of solicitation documents. This is because we want suppliers to be aware of the type of contract they will be entering into, as well as the terms and conditions they are likely to be bound to when doing business with the public body. Let's look at the first type, fixed price contracts. This type of contract works best when requirements are clear. Also, if there's a limited budget and when de where deadlines have been determined, usually for small projects with limited features or complexity. Now, the primary pricing model of the fixed price contract is that the procuring entity will pay a fixed price for the goods works or services that the supplier or contractor must deliver. With this type of contract, the supplier or contractor bears the majority of risk as generally the buyer pays a fixed amount regardless of how much it costs the supplier. Therefore, the supplier has a strong incentive to control costs. On the buyer side, the scope needs to be clearly defined in the specification document, ensuring that the statement of works is sufficiently detailed will help avoid change requests during the contract. As you know, change requests can be costly. So there are three variations to a fixed price contract. This slide provides you with the circumstances for when to use each of the variations. First up, Firm fixed price. This is used when the scope is clearly defined. For example, 
hiring an advert advertising agency to create a logo for a set price. Next variation is fixed price with incentive. This includes an incentive over and above the fixed price if, and I hope you are getting that I'm stressing the if, if a performance goal is achieved. For example, a contractor building a hospital will be paid $100,000 if the contract is fulfilled, that is handed over, before the target date. Note the performance goal here is the target date as stated in the contract instrument. And last, fixed price with economic price adjustment. These adjustments can be upward or downward, but note, Costs are not adjusted based on either party's say so. The price can be adjusted based on the occurrence of specified contingencies. And this is further limited to, for example, industry wide events beyond the supplier's control, be it prices, labor, or material costs, which neither the buyer nor the supplier have control over. These types of contracts usually span multiple years. Determining the most appropriate option requires risks to be considered in your decision making. So, which variation are you most familiar with? Can you see how employing the appropriate contracts that can stimulate competition as well as performance? Let's look at cost reimbursable contracts. This type is mainly used in circumstances that do not allow the procuring entity to define its requirements sufficiently to allow for a fixed price type of contract. And where uncertainties involved in contract performance do not permit costs to be estimated with sufficient accuracy to use the fixed type contract. These include urgent alteration or repair work, building failure, or a fire requiring immediate reconstruction or replacement of a building so as to continue operating. Unlike with the fixed price contract, suppliers would not focus on controlling costs, and this can be costly for the buyer. Additionally, administrative or transaction costs are higher with these types of arrangements, as for example, the buyer has to audit the supplier's costs or invoices, as the, uh, these are reimbursable prior to payments being approved and made. Similar to fixed price contracts, there are also variations to cost reimbursable contracts. On the slide, you will see the circumstances where to use each of these variations. Cost plus fixed fee contract. The supplier's paid costs involved in carrying out the work plus a fixed fee. Now costs refer to whatever the supplier has incurred in delivering on the contract. For example, raw materials, labor, or even facilities rental. Next, cost plus award fee contract. Here the supplier is paid the cost involved and an award fee based on the buyer's evaluation of the supplier's performance. Note that the award amount will have a fixed min maximum cap. For example, the incentive can be a per day amount whereby early delivery earns the supplier $1,000 per day, and the maximum cap will be limited to the award up to 10 days or $10,000. And last, we have cost plus incentive fee contract. Similar to the fixed price plus incentive, the incentive here is a fixed amount. Note, 
This is different from the maximum cap contained in the cost plus award contract. So once the supplier meets the performance goal, they will get a fixed amount of the incentive. Now, just to note here, administering this type of contract requires a high level of skill in multiple disciplines and will definitely require, definitely require a cross-functional team from the inception of the project to the contract close up. Time and material contracts and labor hour contracts are nothing like fixed price contracts. For example, the contract would stipulate, say, $30 per hour rate plus 5% add-on or markup on any materials purchased. The contract can also cap the value of materials to $500 and the number of labor, labor hours to 20 hours. This type is generally used where the scope is not clear or cannot be finalized before the award of contract. And again, this is best suited for smaller contracts. Note that it will be costly to use this for larger projects in terms of the final contract price and because of the high likelihood of scope changes or change requests. The supplier has to be monitored by the buyer as the supplier may not focus on controlling costs, similar to the cost reimbursable contracts, as the buyer pays for this. Also note that this type of contract does not contain any incentives or rewards for early completion. So now that you've been introduced to the types of contracts available to you, how do you decide which to use? We are going to look at 12 factors that can help you decide. First, price competition. Simply put, if there's price competition, a firm fixed price contract is in the procuring entity's best interest as it allows the procuring entity to know the extent of its financial commitment in advance. Next, price analysis. Remember, price equals total cost plus any fee or profit that's applicable. So if you are considering a cost reimbursable contract, then analyzing prices of multiple suppliers, as well as the benefits of their offerings can be used to determine the most appropriate variation of such contracting. Cost analysis. This approach includes a thorough review of the itemized product and service components and related costs. It is essential that the uncertainties involved in performance and their possible impact upon costs be identified and evaluated so that a contract type that places a reasonable degree of cost responsibility upon the contractor can be negotiated. Type and complexity of the requirement. Complex requirements, particularly those unique to the public body, usually result in greater risk assumption by the procuring entity. This is especially true for complex research and development contracts when performance uncertainties or the likelihood of changes make it difficult to estimate performance costs in advance as a requirement, as a requirement recurs or as quantity production begins. The cost risk should shift from the procuring entity to the supplier or contractor, and a fixed price contract should be considered. Combining contract types. You may come across a scenario where the entire contract cannot be a firm fixed price arrangement, and it is okay to consider whether just a portion of the contract can be established on a fixed price, firm fixed price basis. Urgency of requirement. If urgency is a prime factor, the procuring entity may choose to assume a greater proportion of risk or it may offer incentives tailored to performance outcomes to ensure timely contract performance. 
period of performance or length of production run. In times of economic uncertainty or for contracts extending, extending over a relatively long period, a formula for economic price adjustment along with price redetermination clauses must be included in the contract document. Suppliers, supplier or contractors, tactical capability and financial responsibility. I think everyone is familiar with this, but we'll still go through. The technical capacity or experience must be relevant to what you are procuring. For example, experience in building residential houses is not equivalent to experience in building 20-story office complex with underground parking. Economic and financial standing refers to a business organization's scale, financial resources, and insurance, which is a test to determine whether the supplier may be considered as a may be considered. Note, many projects fail because the successful bidder lacks the skills and experience required to manage the challenges and complexities of a particular project, or because the supplier experiences financial distress or becomes insolvent. Adequacy of the supplier or contractor's accounting system. Before agreeing on a contract, other than firm fixed price, the procuring entity shall ensure that the supplier's accounting system will permit timely development of all necessary cost data in the form required by the proposed contract type. This factor may be critical when, one, the contract type requires price revision while performance is in progress, or two, a cost reimbursable contract is being considered and all current or past experience with the contractor has been on a fixed price basis. Concurrent contracts. If you have simultaneous contracts with the supplier, for example, janitorial services at different locations, the impact of those contracts, including the arrangements, should be considered when determining your contract type. Extent and nature of proposed subcontracting. Here you want to look at the best contract option from risk management and allocation, not just between the procuring entity and the supplier, but also with subcontractors. And last, acquisition history. Contractor risk usually decreases as the requirement is repetitively acquired. It also allows product descriptions or descriptions of services to be performed to be defined more clearly by the procuring entity. So here, each successive contract does not have to be the same, same type. Always reevaluate your circumstances. So this slide contains all the factors we just went through. Tell me, did your mi mind tingle just a little recalling the Kraljic matrix, as well as the supply preferencing and positioning models when we were going through these factors? Were you thinking of how placement in the various quadrants of these models could contribute to analyzing these factors and ultimately help you decide which contract would be the most appropriate for your procurement activity? If so, good job. So that brings us to the end of the learning session. Next, we will go into the case study assignment. So please have your case study and template ready from your email. Welcome back everyone. And I will now hand you over to Ms. Supnanan and she will take you through this case study. Thank you, Nandao. Welcome back everyone. Hopefully you were able to access your case study and the template for your response during the break. We have put you into 20 breakout rooms and we are ready to go. So please remember, nominate a scribe to fill in the template, identify someone to present on your group's behalf. Today's assignment is on the screen. 
Uh, so when you're conducting your procurement activities, you will need to complete the procurement strategy development form, as Pastora has been mentioning. Whilst we are not asking you to complete the actual form, today's assignment is on that track. So you're going to use the information from today's session to complete the table on the screen, which is also the template that you received for the outfitting project, which is a case study that you would also have received. So basically, we want you to identify your procurement method, give the reason why, select your contract type, and give the reason why this is appropriate for that particular procurement activity. So you have 30 minutes, and then you will return to the main room where we will review your responses with Pastor Brown. So let's go. Good luck, everyone. <laughs> 